Hi guys, everybody probably already knows me, so I don't have to say too much. You guys know that I paint a little. And uh, I've been really fortunate because the uh, paintings that I used to do, of course, like most people, I started out doing a lot of, um, you know, kids portraits and things like that early on, but then it sort of evolved into corporate things. So when we start the, um, the uh, PowerPoint, uh, what I've done is I've taken each of your paintings and I have put them into, now this might be something different for some of you, and it's a program, of, it's actually an app um, on the iPad, and uh, I think that it's available for other products, other hardware as well, but I, I'm not too sure because I'm an all Apple person at the moment. Um, and what I do is I use an app called Procreate and it is downloadable. Now, when I started using it, it was completely free. I think it probably still is now, but I'm not sure. I should have checked that before we started the program. But um, Procreate allows you to work. Here, I'll show you. See, my iPad is in a in a folder and it allows you to work with an Apple pencil. And I was telling Donna and um, uh, and Margaret before we started that when I was a little kid, Disney used to come out on Sunday night and pick the, the little pixie um, Tinkerbell used to fly across the castle, across the screen, you know, and, and she would wave her this wand and the picture would change. It would just drip down and become an entirely different picture as she was waving that wand. And I kept telling my parents that I wanted a brush like that. And um, I think Procreate and the Apple Pencil have almost done it. <laughs> so if you guys are interested, you know, look it up and see how it works. What I've done is I put each of the paintings into Procreate. And it's a little like uh, Photoshop or any other, you know, um, uh, photo manipulation program, but because you have a pencil, because you can, you know, do things uh, drawing on it or painting on it, you can you can do an awful lot of things with it. And then I just plugged it into the past, um, the PowerPoint so that I can show you exactly what I was thinking about when I looked at the painting. You guys sent me some of the most beautiful things to look at. So what I'd like to do is, oh, Margaret, help me through this. We're going to share the screen. I'm going to take you to my uh, PowerPoint. And um, some of you may have seen this painting of mine at one of the uh, portrait shows in Atlanta some years ago. This is actually, it's called Son of a Fisherman, but it's actually my husband, Doug, who grew up at the coast. And it's a 40 by 30 painting. And that became a size that I ended up using a lot uh, during um, the majority of, of my corporate portraits and things. Sometimes they were larger than that, but this is a really comfortable size to use. I decided to show you just a couple of paintings. That's my studio downtown that I had for years and years. And you can see most of everything that I'm working is much larger than you would expect. Um, and what I have here are, again, a couple of paintings that you have possibly seen in your show in Atlanta at the Marietta Museum and other places. Last year, uh, Professor Soros won an award. I was very pleased about that. And um, the thing about this painting, what's interesting is this is a corporate painting. He retired as the CEO of the company that he had founded, but he refused to do a, um, a, a formal painting. So we, found, we went into his woodworking shop. We, we climbed through different things. We did all kinds of different things. And this just said everything it needed to say about him. He's a very kind and gentle person, a brilliant fellow. This was interesting because he's sort of a Renaissance man. And to tell his story, these are all books that he wrote. All of these books are books he wrote. These are paintings that he painted. And his... Um, he was fascinating. He came to me first as a student, and then every now and then he'd say, oh, sorry, I won't see you for a couple of weeks. I gotta go to um, 
uh, Russia to, to give a talk at the conference for such and such, and then he'd be in China, and then he'd be in Greece, and then he'd be somewhere. It was always interesting working with him. Um, this is a pastel. The others that you've seen are oils. And um, I am a master pastelist with the International Association of Pastel Societies and a signature member of uh, the Pastel Society of America and a couple of others are North Carolina Pastel Society, which I'm so proud of. And um, in this painting, when I went to France to teach, uh, there was an exhibition there and there's a little museum of pastel in a town called saint Olay, France, which is near Bordeaux. And they bought this painting and it's part of their permanent collection now. Um, it's my daughter, by the way. And um, so let's get started. Um, uh, Miss Wilton is in the Netherlands and uh, Margaret sent me two of her images uh, to be looked at, and I'm not sure whether Ms. Wilson is online or not. Can we find out if she has clicked in, Margaret? Do we know? I don't. I don't see anything with her name unless she's on a different name. Uh, Elska, if you're there, um, unmute yourself. If you're not, we'll have this on Zoom for you to watch later. Okay, great. I mean, um, on the uh, YouTube. Okay. Sounds great. Um, what what I was surprised about when I when I um, started receiving all the images, you guys are really talented bunch of people. And um, I, I, I my first initial look at some of the paintings, I kind of went, well, I don't know, I wouldn't do anything to it. So I realized you weren't going to get anything out of this unless I really pushed myself to um, to see maybe a different viewpoint of the same drawing. It's a beautiful chalk and charcoal. And um, what I thought about it was that perhaps she could have pushed it just a little stronger, both in the darks and in the lights. And so what I've done is I've put this painting into um, the Procreate and I've created this little image. Now, what you'll see, yeah, let me see if I can get it started. I'm going to stop it. Now, that's what she sent me. And what I did was I experimented with darkening the, the lash area that creates a bit of a shadow over the eye. And if you get very close to your screen, you're going to notice that in her original drawing here, she has a highlight that is almost directly in the center of the child's left eye. And that physically cannot happen because the pupil of the eye is a hole and it is impossible, I was told, by two different eye doctors to have a highlight directly into the center of the pupil. You can, however, have it at the edge of the pupil where the muscle of the iris moves open and closed like an oculus on a camera. Um, but so what I did was I played a little bit with the, with the eye, just a little bit, both of the eyes, and I wanted to soften the neck area. Let me back it up a little bit. Can you see how, um, the neck area on both sides is a little bit strong, a little bit rigid, not turning backward quite as well as I'd like to see it. So what I've done is I've added a little bit of darkness on both of them. The next thing you'll see is, I'm gonna back it up again. You're gonna see the light on the cheek and on the mouth. And the reason is, again, this is chalk and charcoal, but I think she could have taken it just a little bit further with the lights without making it look shiny, if you know what I'm talking about. I've touched the hair just a little bit and then readdressed the mouth to soften it because children's mouths have such softness all the way around them. Very, even if there's a Cupid's bow that is distinct, it's still very soft in the painting. It should be very soft. And so here darkening the hair just a little bit more. Um, and let's go back and look at the original. And it hasn't changed very much, but just the tiniest bit of brightening. 
and adding the um, catch light in the lower uh, quadrant right here on both of the eyes and a little touch of moisture right inside the eye there sort of softens the look a little bit. Um, she looks a little less pleasant. She seems a little bit happier in this one without changing any of the muscles of the face. I, I um, love the second one that Miss Wilton sent. Um, this is a grand painting. It's just absolutely lovely. And again, I just kind of went, okay, what could I do to that? You know, that's one of those paintings you sort of go, gee, I wish I had painted that. <laughs> but after I stared at it and looked at it the next day, I thought, well, I, I didn't think that this darkness on her forehead was as necessary as it might have looked I'm wondering if this was a self-portrait and uh, working from a photograph. And so I thought about that. And I thought about the un uniform value of the beautiful blonde hair. The fact that there aren't any very distinct lights, maybe that could have been lightened up just a little. But I think that the biggest problem that I would have had with the painting if I were painting it is that I felt that the strength of the architectural um, uh, design behind them really pulls my eye away from the beautiful faces. And these dark and then light and then dark and then here, especially where we have dark light, dark light, dark light. Um, I wanted to see what would happen if I changed some of that uh, value on the bench, graying it, bluing it, greening it down a little bit and pushing it a little further back. The next thing I was concerned about was the position of the hand being a little stiff. I didn't change it, but I changed the direction of light. I felt as though this, arm and hand were perhaps being lit by a reflected light off of the patio or the sidewalk or something like that, which would explain why it would be so bright in the lower shadowed area of the painting. You can see shadows here. We can tell that the lighting is coming from the upper right. So this could possibly have used a little more shadow, uh, especially on these three fingers and this half of the hand and this underside of the arm. Looking at it from that standpoint, I wondered if we could improve the dimensionality of her body by bringing the shoulder forward into the picture plane coming out of the picture plane toward us just a little bit more. And we could do that by just lightening the shoulder and coming down into the arm here, again, reinforcing our light from the upper right side. And this is what it would look like on this little um, change. Now it scrabbles back and forth between several different things. Oops, wait a minute. It, it, so let me show you. This is the original. And now there's a little bit of touching on the back bench. Here we go into her head and her hair. Let me show you that again. The head and hair, the face, that darkness on the, the forehead, lightening that up a bit. Then the bench. Notice that I'm approaching the bench now. And then the hand, and then the shoulder and arm. I'm sorry, I can't slow it down, but I can stop it again. Let me show you the bench. And then, oh golly. <laughs> Hang on. My apologies, guys. So about here is where the bench and then the hand and then the shoulder and arm here. So you can see very slight differences. Let's go back. That's the original. 
and that's the other. Now, also, I suggested that we soften this area, making the two more one. I think that the distinction between them wasn't as necessary as it was. I also darkened this little area down here under her arm on the front of her shirt. And this triangular area on the dog was darkened as well. I'll go back. You see how distinct everything is and how light it is on the underside. And here we go to a little darker area and you see how it, it, it brings us away from this very complicated uh, light and brings us back up to so that this is the most important thing and this is the most important thing and that beautiful line between them. Okay. So now, is Rosie with us? Yes. Hi. Hi. I love this. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great piece. Um, uh, I, I, again, this is one of those things where I kind of go, well, you know, maybe she'll get mad at me if I tell her to fix this or fix that. I think the face reads really well. I think your construction is good. The lighting is pretty consistent. So none of those are problems. Maybe, um, you know, I love painting with palette knife and, and um, one of the pieces of art that went out in this advertising for this critique was a woman with red hair and an abstracted background that was all done with palette knife. What I would suggest is softening this line because it's very dark. This area, the value of it is very dark and we're up against one of the lighter lights in the painting. And I just feel that it is, it's, a, um, it's too sharp of an edge. If we soften and gray that down a little bit, we can roll the shoulder to the background. And um, anatomy wise, I would be very, very careful about the brightness here on the neck so that when you're looking at someone, I know that the light is coming from this side, but we always have to soften those edges into the background. We always have to, to smush this together. That's a technical term. Okay. Right there. So, you know, we can, we can soften that line right there. And I think if any one thing, if, if, if you like or not like those comments, I think the biggest thing is that the yellows, the Indian yellow or um, yellow ochres or a combination of cads and ochres might be a little bit strong. Um, because if we were to, yes, on, on the, the, on the, the yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I just felt like that, these colors really are beautiful and work together, even this peach color here. So what I did with yours going into a little video thing is there's the original and then watch the neck and shoulder areas first. Oh, golly. I, I, I'm going to end up doing this too, too many. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So you see how I'm just sort of scrubbing oh, yeah. over top of that shoulder? Yeah. And not that that's the best way to do it. I mean, um, you know, it's just that I'm trying to find a way with the mechanics here to, to show you this. I changed the, the, uh, the, this wrap too, just a little bit. And then I was sorry I did because I think the original is so beautifully handled with the knife. It's just that the edge of the shoulder softened and dulled down and then this very dark strap that is surrounded by light. I think if you looked at this in a black and white and sort of abstracted it, uh, you'd be able to see that it really gets way too much attention, that thing, and then this color. So watch it again and you'll see where I go with it. And I haven't touched the face at all. I mean, the face and neck are just gorgeous. Background is gorgeous. So, um, so it's just about what I'm doing is I'm knocking down things that aren't important. Right. Anything that's taking my eye away from her face, her, her blue eyes, her expression is detrimental to the painting. So um, go back, you know, like don't, don't do that. 
<laughs> put it back the way you had it, which was uh-huh. which was delightfully handled. Uh, maybe you could soften that edge just a little oh, bit yeah, when okay. you, you know, but just sort of kill that, kill and this a little bit, down. kill that edge a little bit, and pay a little bit of attention to this shape mm-hmm. and, and value there. It's really a delightful piece. Um, uh, I'll let you see it one more time. And like I said, I've, I've written, on some of these, I've written the explanation to the side so you can see it. And uh, thank you. Is Sharon here? I am. Hi, Sharon. Hi. These are fantastic. Is this a self-portrait? Yes, it's a self-portrait. And, and my two and my two babies. And your two babies. And CPP stands for Chicago Pastel Painters. I'm an, I'm a signature member. Perfect. That's <laughs> great. I grew up not far from there. Really? And uh, yeah, I I'm I grew up in northern Indiana, right over the line from Chicago uh, uh-huh. by, by Lake Michigan, and then I moved to Rome, Italy when I went to high school and um, met my crazy. Carolina husband in Switzerland in college. So uh, that's how I got here. Let me tell you what I thought of this. Um, I think it's a great, a great design. I love the diagonal of the three faces. And these guys, I mean, I mean, I can hear them breathing. They are delightful. What, what I was concerned about was the distraction of this part of the painting. Hmm. I felt like that um, really took too much attention away from the faces. Uh-huh. So, I mean, we all have different ways of looking at things. So this is just one approach uh-huh. to doing a painting like this another time, perhaps. But let me show you a couple of things that, that I did. One of the things, and I probably toned this down too much, uh-huh. which I, you know, could have controlled a little better but look at the difference yeah it does make it look yes you see by taking those lights away from the knees yes it, it takes me upward into the lights that are surrounding the faces uh-huh. another point that I was looking at was this bright under his belly and the sharp line uh-huh. and then the very distinct nails all uh-huh. of them exactly the same value. Mm-hmm. You think that those rounded head nails would catch the light differently and they could possibly be less important because they're little targets, they're little white dots on dark background. Uh-huh. So again, you've got this yellow, one of the most chromatic yellows in the painting. Look how brilliant that, that intensity is. Uh-huh. And if you just cover it with your hand in front of your screen, that whole lower I, section, yes. look at what happens as we change one of those. See the belly disappears? Yes. Yes. See the, the dog's belly, watch his belly. Let me back it up, back it up, watch his belly. When he, that disappears and then the yeah. nails disappear and then the yellow next to the chair disappears and uh-huh. then the arm. Uh Now, let me talk about the arm. The arm, because of its brilliance, is coming forward. You actually have, I know it's in the light. I know it's on the light side of the the chair. Uh And I might have over-exaggerated how dark it could go. Uh But but watch the difference between the original painting and that arm and his head and his head now. Mm Mm-hmm. You see the yeah. two heads and how differently they look. And yeah. honestly, I didn't touch anything. I didn't touch him. I didn't touch him. Didn't touch you. None of that was where I was going. All of it had to do with finding ways of taking down the distractions so that the important part, this beautiful part here, uh-huh. can be seen first. Uh, yeah, those are good comments. Thank you. Okay, Great. good. Good, good, good. The only thing um, is, both my dogs are girls. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> my apologies. That's okay. <laughs> my apologies. But um, uh, the 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 whole, I mean, if 
you start looking at things that way where you say, okay, if am I doing something that's going to help the painting or hurt the painting? Right. And right. every stroke you put on, if you go, okay, does this make it better or does this make it different but not better? Or right. does it make it distracting? So, I mean, I spend more time talking to the paintings than I do painting yeah. them sometimes. Yeah. Okay. And this one, this is yours as well, isn't it? Yeah. Right, right. Okay, Marty and his horn. I got really excited about this one. I hope this has gone into a couple of shows. because It has. Gorgeous. It's actually it won honorable mention in the Dakota Pastel Annual. Uh, oh, oh, that's gosh. fantastic. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank you. You know, obviously I wouldn't change this painting since it's already been seen in public and won an, uh, an award. But let me let me talk to you in the same way about this painting okay. as we did with the other one. Uh huh. Is there anything here that is distracting, or it does it or it stands out too much, taking too much attention away from what's important? Well, based me, on what, based on what you've shown before, I would say the chair is too distracting. Okay. Because it doesn't really add anything to the picture. Okay, what is the, the point of the story? Um, he was actually, he was just sitting outside posing for me. And uh, he really enjoys the clarinet. He's good at it. And I okay. love his face. I paint him all okay. the time. He's and great. <laughs> that's just okay. the story. Can that's you see my cursor? Yes. Can you see this? Okay. So to me, it's all about this. Yeah. Yes. And this. Yes. Yes. And this. Yes. All right. So now what can we do to get rid of other distractions? And I would say that this is a distraction. These lights here. Now, I know he's sitting in the light, mm -hmm. but is the intensity of that light blue necessary? So let's look at it from a different standpoint. Uh, do not touch this painting now that it has been awarded please don't ever go back into this painting however um and i've probably overemphasized the distractions look at the difference between his head hands and horn mm -hmm. heads hands and horn so you can make another painting and call it heads hands and horn <laughs> um and look at the difference between that one and this one uh -huh. uh, I would not take the colors down quite that much. I didn't have a good way of doing this and, and continuing the beautiful mark making that you were doing. Mm -hmm. So forgive me for that, but look at the video as it, as it, okay, there's the beginning. Uh -huh. And what I did was on his pants first, the chair, and then his arm. Mm -hmm. And the lower arm, and then the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually worked from the bottom up. And I did include the chair, as you had suggested. I think the shininess of the chair might be a little distracting. So if, if you can look at this and then go back and say, okay, well, I, I, the distraction has to do with all of this mm -hmm. being a little too light and this being a little bit too intense but it's so beautifully painted, it, it's hard to fault this stuff. Okay, so that's with the pants, the chair, and the lower arm mm -hmm. in shadow. And I think that that's not a bad thing, putting that lower arm in shadow. Mm -hmm. And then there, see the difference? Yeah. This piece of the arm was brought down, the value of it was brought down, watch, see the difference? Uh-huh. And so now everything, this is all, this is the story. This is the center part of the story. Now, again, your style, I would never restrict you as much as I've done on this drawing, but, but it's what we can do with, you know, the machinery right. and the minute, the minutes that we had to do it. Okay. Uh -huh. But it's gorgeous. I love your style. I love your technique. Yeah. I'd like to see more of your stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So Roberta, we talked right before the thing started. Um, what I was going to say to you is that when you did this painting for your neighbor, um, 
Uh, apparently it's a selfie because this is either an L, uh, um, a wrist or a shoulder. And she is holding the phone out in front of the dog's face. The dog's, I'm sure the dog's big, but you know that cameras expand the size of things as they come closer to the, to the um, lens. So um, what, what I did here was, you'll see this change. Uh, what I did was I sort of toned this all down so that it, it doesn't become part uh, too important. You know, uh, this light against dark here, everybody's going to kind of go, well, what is that exactly? Yeah. So, so getting rid of that would be, you know, sometimes don't fight it. Just move forward, you know, do what you know is right. Don't worry about what the, the photograph is telling you. Um, with her, um, again, this is camera distortion. There is a little bit of, of torquing of the flat front plane of the face so that this eye is a little higher than that eye. Oh, I see that now. Uh, yeah, and then the jawline got a little lost here. I would assume that it's a little rounder. So I was just guessing. Yeah. And what I did was this, you know, I didn't see the reference material and I changed it all by just darkening this. He becomes more important. The hair becomes darker. This That's becomes cool. darker. Yeah, I love that. And sort of putting that on the same plane. Now, I took away all your beautiful strokes in, in covering them up in this manner. So forgive me for that. But what I was trying to do was to get you from, to see how the camera can change things. You see this eye, this nose and this mouth are all right on target. So yeah. that eye needs to come yeah. down a little bit. And you can see why I took this distraction uh, away. Yeah, that's so You know, better. you see the difference? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so just play with it and um, next time, you know, try, try to experiment. If you've given the painting to her already, um, you know, maybe play with a little drawing and see if you can detect those differences in the, um, in the picture that she gave you. When she gave you this picture to work from, uh, same thing, you know, big head, little rump. And I think, silly as it sounds, I think that this in the head leading into this dark in the trees is a little distracting as are these differentials from tree to ground in the background. So lose things in the background to make him more important. Okay. And potentially give him a little bit bigger rump. So that, so that, you know, we, we see that, that, you know, the way they sit on their haunches like that when they're panting, it's very cute. One thing here to look at is this is the darkest dark in the painting. And this is almost the lightest light. This is the lightest light. But, but right here, having this dark, dark and light light next to one another really sort of forces your eye to look at that first. So let me show you what I played with. Okay. Um, what happened here is I messed around. Okay, that's the original. What I did is I messed around with the background first. Let's see if I can get my cursor to work. See the background? Yeah. Oh, yeah. See that again? Yeah. I just played and kind of reduced the background so it's much less important. And look how his... Yeah. His, now it comes forward when you do that. Even with the yellow greens in the background, his snout comes forward when you unify everything. Okay. And then, it, then the next thing I did was I put a little bit of a shadow here and then I kind of made this less distinct and then I improved this shape, uh, just bringing that upward a little bit. You know, these are just suggestions. You do not have to do this stuff. It's just something to look at. See yeah. the difference? Yeah, I like the, and in the back. Isn't that kind of fun? 
Yeah, it's much so, better. So the idea is, again, you know, trying to find ways to, if this is the story, don't distract us from that. You know, don't, don't let us be looking at things in the corners or in the background or in the foreground. You know, make us look where you want us to look. You can control it. Okay? Very cool. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> this, is Mary Ann here? Yes, I'm and, here. Oh, hi. Hi. Who is this model? This is just a gorgeous <laughs> pet. <laughs> I'm desperate for live models. He was a, a drywaller that came to work in my kitchen. That and girl. I, oh, please. Can I paint you? <laughs> I, I did yes. take pictures of him. <laughs> yes, you've got to be very careful of that. Come here, little boy. Can I paint you? Uh, so be cautious. <laughs> very tall. But, he, was, he was watching the guy work on the drywall. He was supervising. It, it's just it's just a great pose. It's a great combination of colors. I love your strokes. Um, the pastels are really strong. I particularly love these passages of mixed colors here. What I would do is try to find a way to make it even more dramatic. What if he wasn't watching somebody put up drywall? What if he was singing? What if he was praying? What if he was asking for help? You know, what, what, you know, how can we make it a little more dramatic? One of the things I would do is um, possibly tone down a little bit of the color in the neck. Uh -huh. So that it's not quite as strong because it's really brilliant compared to everything else. And you repeated the color here, and I'd rather see this than uh -huh. this. Okay. And then the other thing is, I, I understand the putting dark and light against here, but if you were to darken the background, how how would the face appear if we had him against a darker background? So let me show you what I was playing with. Okay. And what, there's the original. And now the neck, the background, and the neck again. Uh -huh. And, and uh -huh. what I did was I just took your colors and sort of layered a little cooler version here, correcting a little bit of shape, knocking down the light on his neck back here, uh -huh. and then adding this color or excuse me, this value to the background really doesn't, isn't bad because what we've got now is something, again, let's look at it from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. There, take the shape on the neck. You see what we're doing on the neck here? Uh -huh. I'm, I'm sort of playing with these shapes and making sure that we get that nice shape there into the, took the light out of here and then let's proceed so we start putting background in I sort of knocked over top of this a little too much maybe but we could lose that and you know it's further away from us but look how cool that is when it's finished so look at the beginning and then look at that it, that would be easy to do I'm not telling you to do it I'm just saying that these are options to think about when you're doing something like this again, maybe, you know, um, I, I just think that, that he, you can create a lot more drama in the painting with very little, you know, effort. Uh -huh. And this one is gorgeous. Never, she needs something else. Just her. Um, Who is she? She is Virginia. I think her name is. Yeah. She, she models for a group I'm in, but of course with COVID, we're having, a, we're not having live models right now, so. Yeah, well, for all of you oil painters who don't do pastel, this elephant colored paper is absolutely the most wonderful thing to work on with faces. And I love the precipitated chalk here. You can't get that with oil. You know, this is just chalk that decided not to stay where it was supposed to, and it just, snowed down onto the paper and you can't get that when you want it to happen so this is great again what I was toying with her I mean I love her expression um, I actually experimented too much on yours 
and and I um, sort of defined the apple here by the zygomatic bone. I made it a little warmer, and I made it much more dramatic by make, by playing off of this light on her face and really darkening the background and toning this down a little bit. Mm -hmm. I also thought that maybe these lights were taking us out of the picture, taking us out of the picture. Since this is on the shadow side of the painting, yeah, you actually, could. Actually, the whole, that's a close-up. She's in a wicker chair and ah. the scarf goes on over, yeah. But, but I just zoomed in on the, the face. Well, I think it's a great zoom in on. So <clears throat> one of the things is when you determine how you want to finish it, the gold of the earring, I think, would be a really fun thing to peek out from the shadows. But it is it needs to really be in the shadows more and just catch a glint of shine on it to tell us that it's a gold earring. Uh -huh. So I, like I said, I overdid yours. And I even, why not make the face darker, even more dramatic? Why not make this whole area darker and enhance the darkness here? And actually, well, here, let me just show you. Okay. Quit talking and do it. <laughs> so there's the beginning. There's a, a, an approach to the background and toning down some of the scarf and some of the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And then here I went crazy on the face and just, you see the, the whoops, here we go. Um, watch it again. You see how, how that can, this can tone down so that we don't look at her shoulder first, we look at this. And this becomes so much stronger because we've put this in the background. Uh -huh. This is the original color of the paper. I'm telling you to grab one of Terry Ludwig's um, eggplant and, uh -huh. and just fill that fill that baby right in there. Boy, that would be just gorgeous. And what then about, this has been. What about her ear? The it, it well, needs I didn't, to see too. Yeah, I, yes, this this is in the shadow. This should reflect that. This should explain that that's in the shadow, not in light. You can never have anything in the shadow side of the head that's as light as something in the light side of the head. So this whole pattern here has to be dealt with as well. And I could I could have continued a few more minutes and and taken that down as well. Okay. Just put your put your hand in front of it and and your your skin tone will actually tell you how much more you need to go down. Look yeah. at that right there. So so here's the beginning and here's an option. Uh -huh. Okay? All right. Thank you so See, much. I even set it down here. Don't leave the earring too bright. So, <laughs> so take that ear, take that ear and earring down. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, you betcha. So Jill, Jill, are you here? Yes, I am. Seen you in ages. How's things going? <laughs> Just fine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love your stuff. You have such creative, great ideas. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. This was the original picture you sent to me, and what I was thinking about was um, this line here and this line here. I was wondering if you could take this down and punch this up. What's interesting is you just sent us a new picture in which you did part of that. And what I wanted to ask are a couple of things. The wire, mm -hmm. what is this? What part of the story does that involve? Uh, going to the little white square is an electronic device. And okay. I, to me, she, this woman with this dog looked like a Madonna and I was trying to um, both play with that and work against the idea of a Madonna to bring it into the okay. So, okay, so and, and the idea of the repetitive portrait as um, a shadow effect or an, um, a movement or uh, different um, versions of expression, I love that. And Jill, what I did was I wanted to show you 
someone else's painting. Um, I hope you don't mind, but this is Sally Strand's pastel. And I think that's one of the best usages of that sort of um, finding ways of using the same subject matter and just making it work for you. I mean, she's really telling a story of movement and oh my gosh, it's the beginning of a, a new part of my life and look how you know, the baby never is still or quiet. And I mean, it really helps to set a tone in that painting. And then this is the um, image that you sent to us uh, last night. Mm -hmm. And um, and I love the fact that you darkened all of this. My real question is going to be, could you also make this less important in the background? I did not put this into the, the procreate, but if this were darker, it wouldn't catch our attention quite as much. And it would throw our attention to this dark and light, which I think is just brilliant. I just love the way they're looking at each other. And I'm, I'm, I'm just excited about this hand. That's a gorgeous, gorgeous hand. I possibly would have warmed up the difference between the two and maybe softened here allowing the two to sort of press against one another and not make them quite as distinct. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want it to get harsh. And, and so whenever we add too much of those dark colors, they're a little too gray, a little too dark. But, but what a beautiful concept for a painting. Um, on your notes, you were talking about this. Can you, can you share this with the others? Uh, sure. I had originally painted them pretty much full value as if they were in the same space and possibly a little bit more like the Sally Strand painting, not as nice as that. And um, uh, then I wanted to ghost them back. So I started playing with uh, glazing over them and pushing and pulling parts of them back and forth. And it's just been a terrible struggle. And at some points I've just said, oh, just wipe them out and make it one figure. Um, so I threw it into the critique to see if there was any hope for it the way it is. Well, I love it. And I, I think in my case, you know, this is one of those paintings, you know, other artists kind of go, hmm, how would I have done it? I wonder if I wouldn't have paid less attention to the mullions and the window and really made this second one a little stronger and then possibly allowing this one to go just a little bit stronger sort of losing this square that square is really really harsh mm -hmm. for what it is um i would make you know she's fully realized she could be less but more realized less than her but more than it's done and then this one brought up just a little bit so that we can get a great feeling for that profile. The fact that you change the position of the head is just delightful. And the fact that, you know, this is sort of a, not quite a front on view, a three quarter view. This one's turned a little more, this one's full profile. I love that, but I'd like to see these images maybe a little bit more. And I think then the, the balance of the painting would be would be better too, because when you set it to this side of the painting uh, and this gaze being the center focus, I still think that the balance could be helped by, you know, bringing those up a little bit more. What are these? They were actually wrapped up books. They were wrapped in uh, brown paper. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, it's interesting to me that you use so many curvilinear, oh golly, I'm sorry guys, uh, that you use so many curvilinear designs in this and, and kept that curve going and kept us looking at the two of them. And then in this other part of the painting, this rigidity, these straight lines, these, you know, straight, 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 angle, 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 edges. Um, the tables, the, um, it's a real um, challenge to balance all that. I think what you did brilliantly was handle the values between the mullions and the outside 
and here, I think a lot of artists less experienced than you would have made these much too strong, much too contrasty. So I think those are really beautifully done. And I wonder if, if that couldn't have been, you know, you couldn't just lose a little bit of the strength of those darker divisions here, much like what I was talking about there. Just mm -hmm. make some of that disappear a little bit. And, um, and then, yeah, I'd really love to see this, this go darker and less important. I don't think the, the tail of that um, drape is nearly as important as what's going on on the table and, and with their expression and her hands. Beautiful. That's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good, good. And this one, brilliant. This is, this is one of the ones that came in and I kind of went, well, what's that? I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, I stared at it for a couple of days and I kind of went, well, if I was going to paint that and you were posing for me, what would I have done differently if, if it was my design instead of yours? And I think what I would have done is take the etrage and, and actually use some of that color elsewhere in the painting. Mm -hmm. So what I was toying with was changing this palette into a wooden palette, a curved one, no less. Because mm -hmm. I think this is kind of pointing us out of the painting, whereas a curved one would repeat this curve and this curve and this curve mm. and how, you, you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. The other part of it is, that is just a brilliant head and I think it's competing with the background just a little bit. As beautifully as this design is done, and I can understand why you would get interested in doing all of this architecture, this design up here. I love that. But again, if I was doing the painting and I stood you there and I was my paint to paint, my painting to paint, I would have, instead of using the cream colors, would have used a cooler color to force the design to stay put and to stay firmly in the background. And in that case, taking mm -hmm. some of this warmth out and maybe toning this down. I love the way it frames your head, but the head is so exquisite that I really hate that this can take away from it. So let me show you what I did. You may hate it, but <laughs> it's just another way of looking at it, okay? Um, there, oops, that's really different. Um, let me see. Mm -hmm. Now. Mm -hmm. It's pulled together more, I can see that. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's just it's just another option, you know. All mm -hmm. all that I did effectively was I took the brilliance out of this corner because this was a really dark dark. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I put the palette in and based it off of generally these colors, and then I just cooled and neutralized the ceiling. Now I probably overlaid a little bit too much on the ceiling. I think I might have kept the design, but toned the color and value down. Do you understand? I would have kept that, the structure. Uh, um, and But here, you, you saw me lay stuff on top of that here. Let's look at it again. See if I could stop it or not. Um, so, I started with playing with the palette, softening it, rounding it, adding the colors back onto the palette, and then um, going into the upper left corner over top of the, uh, the model, the statue. Uh, look at it again. You see behind the statue's head how I've added some cool. Mm -hmm and then tone down the entire ceiling. And now I'm gonna hit the painting. And I'm gonna add the color back onto the palette. So you see, now 
you are obviously the most important thing in that painting. And it's so beautifully done. I didn't touch anything on your hand, the head, the mannequin, um, the angles of the head here. Um, Ancora and Paro is absolutely, um, it's, a, it's just, a, for those of you that don't speak Italian, it means I'm still learning. Um, and aren't we all? Um, so uh, gorgeous, just gorgeous. And um, thank you. That's great. That's very helpful. I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. That's You're true. welcome. And I'm really glad to see it. It's just a great picture. I love it. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Don't be a stranger. Stay in <laughs> okay. touch. Will do. This is Rosemary. Rosemary, are you here? Yes, I am. Hi. Talk to me about your watercolors. Uh, this uh, happens to be a, a model from the same group Marianne Cox referred to. Um, okay. As modeling for us. Is and it is it the the New Orleans group with Sandra Bruchel? No, it's in Athens, Georgia. Oh, good. Well, I I used to teach watercolor for fifteen years at one of the art centers here in North Carolina, and. I, I just love your work. Um, I think, um, again, you know, just trying to find something that we can say, well, let's look at it a different way. What if, what if we didn't try to fit the arm onto the page? What if that arm just disappeared? Would it make the painting stronger if this wasn't um, distracting us into that corner? And then um, I was wondering, uh, about stre strengthening, just go crazy, strengthening the colors, you know, knock down the light a little bit and just strengthen these colors all the way through here, uh, going another, another layer or two more. I know that when I was teaching watercolor that my problem with watercolor in the beginning was always that I felt like I should be able to mix a a value a color and put one brilliant stroke on the page and, and it should work and it didn't always work. <laughs> so I found that my more successful watercolors were when I let them completely dry, bone dry, and went back onto them, Amazing. understanding that I could disrupt what was under it if I got too vigorous with my brushwork. Right. But if you don't push the color around so that it disturbs what's already there, you can do five, eight, 10 layers of color and really build it up. Now, I will tell you that when I did this little video thing, I actually messed up your shirt. I, I, I love the uh, blooms and the things that are happening here. I love that you lost the edges between here and the background. I love this color just disappearing into the background. But let me show you what I did for good, for bad. It, 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 it is what it is. Um, what I did was I changed the background more than anything. I wanted her to stand out more. I strengthened the clavicle area here and deleted or toned down some of the lights here, bringing uh, um, a softer, more um, melodious sort of movement from one cheek to the, the the bridge of the nose to the other cheek. So let me show you again. This is the original. And then you see how I stepped this into dark. Yes. To make this much more important. And then I started playing with her face. And then again, like I said, I removed a little here to exaggerate or emphasize the clavicle and then lightened up her shirt even more. But in doing so, of course, I destroyed the beauty of the watercolor, the bloom. However, I think it's stronger without that mm -hmm. arm in the bottom corner. What do you think? Yes, I agree. Very helpful. Yeah. So it's, you know, I mean, the beauty of watercolor is that, that you really can play and play and play with it. Uh, notice too, the under the chin, how I grayed down that skin a little bit. 
yes. and and made it turn just a little bit more okay. in, instead of it being a little rigid here yeah you see the difference yes yeah so you know uh, um women's portraits that was one of the things Sargent always did was he always made their necks much longer than they really were and much more slender. It gave it such a rhythmic and beautiful feel um, to the body, the way the head would sit onto the neck and then the way the neck would sort of flow into the trapezius and then into the shoulder and all of that. Thank you for bringing that. That's just beautiful. This one um rosemary yes the same person <laughs> yes yes this one rosemary it, it's just um it is it is um palette knife some yes yes Good. yes okay and it's also um is it on a board yes it's on a um, centurion um, yeah 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 okay yeah. good well, to me, I, you know, I love, I love working with palette knives. And, and um, with her, I actually, um, I love the color combination. Um, I, I felt like uh, maybe another hour with her, you would have gone ahead and gotten braver to, to exaggerate the dark light pattern and the richness of the skin tone. Um, as far as construction, I, I love the pursing of the mouth. I can see her doing that. I, I love the stare of the eyes. Um, I felt like the ear was, was maybe um, isolated a little too much, that it still sits on the shadow side of the head and therefore the colors and the value could have fit more into that, to that space. So let me show, I, again, uh, forgive me, I don't know why I did these to your two paintings, but I really kind of overdid a little bit. And, so and I w what I was trying to do, which I should have gone back and redone this before I showed it to you. What I was trying to do, uh, understand that I'm not trying to, to change the construction of the face. I shouldn't have, have done some of it, but I was trying to get, stay in your color palette and strengthen to make me look more at this right. than when we started, okay? Then I wanted to strengthen right. the shadow side. So I was just making it braver, braver colors. You know, just, you'd have gotten there for if you had sat with her another, if this was a two session sitting instead of one. Um, but by lightening back here to have her pull away from the background and darkening over here, it, it gave, would give us uh, an opportunity to see her in a slightly different, different light. You see how much stronger the color is here and the color is on the zygomatic bone and under the mandible. And, you know, didn't change anything here, um, but, you know, she comes out from the background. We could have brought this color down even more and maybe brought that purple back up into it even more. But you see how the ear sits better into the yes. shadow. Yes. So it's just, you know, it's just experiments. And, and what you have to do, all of you, I think I, I improved my painting when at one point, um, you're gonna laugh at me, but I had done a painting and had been paid for it at a time when all the other bills were paid. The rent on the studio and the, the telephone book advertising, this is how long ago it was. And the, uh, you know, the, the memberships and everything, everything was paid and suddenly there was this check that came in and this is lots and lots and lots of years ago and I kind of went, you know, if I could start this painting over, I would have done it this way. And rather than paint over top of a painting and try to continue to correct and correct and correct, I, I mean, I think people who do drawings and people who do pastels, 
I mean, sometimes we'll get in there and we'll go, eh, 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 really trying to get that, <laughs> you know, really trying to get that correction. And the paper or the board just won't take any more pastel. So we can't always make the corrections we, we want. So I did two or three of my paintings over. I, I used the good linen. I used the good oil paint. I used the good everything. And I'll tell you what, it was so freeing because it allowed me to say, all right, I can use that canvas for something else. Another, I'll paint over it another time. But rather than try to correct a painting that was not working, I literally sat it up on an easel next to the easel I was using, and I just started over again. Yeah. And <laughs> one of the three paintings I did that to was a portrait that I was working on for a client that had three women and a cat in it. And I literally pulled another 48 square canvas and started the three women and the cat and the sofa and the living room and the background and all of it over again. And it worked. It, it came together in a very different way than if I had forced myself to continue correcting. So you guys need to loosen up. And think of all the money you've saved on not going to restaurants. And uh, what? Or traveling. Or traveling. traveling. Gasoline. All of those things. Thank you so much. Okay. (laughs) So, all right. So, Mike, is Mike with us? Mike, did you give up? Did you go? Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Hi, Mike. Um, I noticed that your painting was in the show, so Grace must have liked it as well. And uh, I think it's a beautiful double portrait. It's a really nice idea to to do some things like this every decade or so, so that your family has a lovely um, remembrance, if nothing else. Let me show you what I what I was thinking. Mike sent this to me, and he said, "Well, let me let you talk to them." Tell them what you said about this. Well, um, when I showed this to my wife, she liked her portrait, but she said mine just did not look like me. She said, that's not my husband. And I cannot figure out what's wrong with it. I've made measurements. I've looked at um, you know, the different values between this and the reference photo. And uh, it's really I, hard. I cannot figure out what's wrong with it. It's really nice that your wife liked hers because that, it's sometimes that, that was, I, I was thrilled with that. Bonus. That was the bonus. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I thought about the painting as a whole was that I, I perhaps would not have done the background in the same color and value as the suit. I think I would have found a cooler color or maybe a really rich dark burgundy you know darker than what her clothing is or something something just different than than um that gray tone because i think you're fighting against it a little bit over here i noticed that you've added a cooler tone that seems to really read well um i think self-portraits are really hard unless you use the double mirror version of it because when we see ourselves in a mirror and we make a portrait, we are looking at the reverse of ourselves. So what she sees is very different than what you see in the morning when you're shaving. It's as simple as that. Um, you're obviously using a photograph because it is painting you yes. in real life. It's not painting mm-hmm. you in reverse. So one of the things I did uh, was this. Uh, Let me go there. Um, This was the reference that you said you were working from. And she's lovely and good for you. I think it's a great rendition of her. And no, I wouldn't have recognized that as you either. I think that this fellow is jovial and fun and interesting. And he's got a little glint in his eye and I, I didn't see any of that in the painting. I think you were working too hard on it. I think you need to loosen up. 
So what I did was I cut that piece of the painting and I was gonna ask you one thing. Let me go back to the painting as we saw it. Is it slightly turned in any way from the camera or is it perfectly flat onto the camera? I, um, I tried to make it perfectly uh, flat to the camera. It may be turned okay. just a little bit, but I, it, I, tried, it to, I tried to get directly in front of it. Okay. Um, it may, it, this is one of the things about working from photographs that makes everybody crazy. So you're not alone, but let, let me go forward and let me show you what I did was I took this out of the painting and then I enlarged it. So there was the same size as the uh, reference material. Then I did lines and I was going, okay, if I drew a line from his uh, brow bone at its widest point through the cheekbone here on there. And I did the same thing over here. And I looked at this draw, uh, this photograph. There's a distinctly different size to the face. This is, needs to be broader. So let me show you how the lines, that's the way it looks without the lines. If I start adding the lines, you can see what I'm doing. I'm actually touching the cheekbone, the widest part of the brow bone in all okay. the Yeah, you're, yeah you're, you're basing it off of the uh, cheekbones, okay. The cheek, right here, the, over the eyebrow, right there, if you can still see mm -hmm. on your monitor. Right there, right there. And if you watch, let me see if I can get my cursor to do. So now we're looking at the eyes. Now you got the eyes, okay. you know, pretty right. This eye dropped just a little bit. And then if you look at the nose, you've added more nose than you actually have. Because if I put the line across on the mouth, you're really pretty on target with mouth. So what's happening here is that there's okay. a broadness to your head here, but you still have to fit it into the box of the front plane and the two side planes. So what I'm showing you is a little bit of drawing outward to match this shape and size, okay? Also, you dropped to a much thinner design here and you drop the trapezius muscle and where the jacket sits here should be much further up than where you have it on your picture. Let me just proceed through it. And what I'm doing is showing you here the design of that. And I'm boofing you up. We're gonna give you a little bouffant because what you did with the top of the head, let's go back here. Notice how this is more elliptical shaped than this is. Yeah, okay. You see that? So all of, I don't okay. know why we do this to ourselves, all of us who want to paint portraits, because everybody on the planet knows what a face looks like, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. But to make it a specific person, it is the tiniest, the my, most minute movement to the left, to the right, up, down, front, back. You know, it is, it is, I don't know why we do it to ourselves, but okay, well, so there. That's one thing I found is that it just, it does not take much of an error at all to completely lose the, the likeness. And you can make it into an entirely different person. Yeah, right? okay. So let me take this to the end and, and you can see, whoops, I didn't do that. There, watch it. Here we go. Watch the width of the hair, the width of the face, the higher jacket line, and don't lose the dimple. You also didn't make a strong enough jawline. I think you've got a really strong jawline. So let me show you now what I did here. I broadened the front of the face plane here. Mm -hmm. I shortened the nose and messed around with yellow greens into the hair color and broadened the hair. I darkened your eyebrows. Now I used a pencil part 
of the procreate to, to redraw some of this. And then I didn't go back in and I, I ran out of time. I didn't go back in and finish some of this, but then I changed the shoulder line to match mm -hmm. and I strengthened the shadow under here. So by livening up the background, notice how the background changed. Watch this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, okay. That's what we started with. Now don't, don't look away because you're going to see it happen quickly. See how I change shadows on the face? Mm -hmm. I change, oh boy. I change shadows on the hair. And then I started lightening and broadening the brow. I added more hair. I added more color. I, I changed a lot of the color. And there you go. What happens is the more you mess with it. Now, if I had two or three hours to mess with it, I could bring it up to, you need to go back and add a little more of the golden tones to it. But you see how the hair, mm -hmm. can you see that? I'll show it again. Yeah, that, okay. That looks, that one looks like a person and is, is beginning to look a little bit more like me. Isn't that the neatest thing? So okay. uh, again, the, it, it, this would, I would have loved to have been in a classroom with you with actual paint and brushes in our hands because sometimes you can do little five by eight uh, oil sketches and do brilliant stuff with it to practice. And the picture is the downfall. The real problem is working from photos. Now I know that we've got brilliant artists in our Portrait Society group that have to work from photographs. Sometimes um, the entire commission is done strictly from the photographs. I've worked with posthumous paintings, of course, that, um, that allowed us in my case, I was lucky because I not only had a photo that they wanted to use, but they also gave me, by my request, younger photos, photos in different positions, photos from outdoors and indoors in different lighting, and a little videotape from Christmas. And to make a posthumous portrait work, I was able to watch this gentleman in lots of different lighting and lots of different movements tilted, you know, to really see how the head hung on the neck and how he, his expressions changed with different, you know, activities. So what happens, I think, is we become too slavishly devoted to this one photograph and we, we try too hard to make the photograph look, the painting look like the photograph. Um, when you do these little five by eight, oh, I should have grabbed those. I wonder where I put them. Um, uh, one of the things, one of the things that happens when you're doing this sketch work, let me go see if I can grab something. I'll be right back. <clears throat> um, are some of you going to the Portrait Society convention that we normally have in Atlanta or Washington? I can't hear anybody, so I shouldn't have asked the question. Last year when we had our conference, I, I'm sorry, I, this is true confessions right now. I ended up doing paintings while the programs were going on. And what I did was, Tell me if you can see this, Margaret. We can see it. Okay. We can see that's it. Rich, mm -hmm. That's Richard Schmidt and Nancy Goodsick. And uh, I did it because she kept staring at him like a uh, lovely teenage girl in love with her first, you know, heart throb. And I thought it was just so darn cute. I had to sketch it. So these are little five by sevens. You guys know who that is? Quang Ho, and like I said, they're little five, five by sevens. 
Um, Tony Ryder. Now, believe me, these didn't take long. These were things that I did while they were talking. Okay, can you see them? Um, and then a couple of times uh, people had models and while they were talking, the cameraman had the picture, the, uh, the, the framing was on the speaker, but the model was sitting in a different position under different lighting, not paying attention to the pose that they were supposed to be in. So I did this one and this one from model. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is take the photograph, turn it into a sketch in black and white or color and see how it changes for you. And if it can give you new insights into shapes and sizes, always look for sort of geometric shapes. When, when, when Margaret and Donna and I talked about this program, I said, if I have a couple minutes extra, I'll be happy to answer questions from anybody. Um, Mike, do you have any questions about what we did with you? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think I'm pretty well understand what I need to try to do now. I, I think everybody can tell from the, the uh, comments that you've made that I'm at a much more fundamental level with my portraits than everybody else is. I'm, I'm absolutely I think you're doing fine. of everybody else's portraits. You know, we've all heard that comment about um, you're only going to be as good as the miles of canvas you cover. So, um, yeah. so you just you got to keep experimenting. But does anybody else have questions about anything before I make a couple comments about photography? Uh, before you do anything else, Luana, could you hold up those little uh, critique paintings there again? You there you go. All right. So uh, maybe there's too much light on it there. Maybe that way. All right. Let me see. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and then here's one. Mm. Yeah, we can see that now. Yeah, and these are on ampersand gesso boards, so they're very easy, lightweight. I put glassine paper between them and just stack them up in a pile. My brother asked me recently, "What are you going to do with all these?" I said, "I don't know. I'll let the kids worry about it when I'm gone." That's those are John the actual. Knightley. Those are the oh, actual okay. painting. Those are the actual paintings, aren't they? These are paintings. Yes. Yeah. Those are beautiful. Don Whitelaw. Yeah, Don. And then Tony Ryder. Yeah. This and is all. This is all oils. These are all oil, and this is Quang Ho. Yeah. Who just had a baby recently? Yeah, I saw that. And then this was Nancy, and um, we just lost him. He was such yeah. a sweet man. But she always looked at him like that. No matter what they were doing, they were always together, and it was great. So, so anyway, um, you know, that's my way of practicing. I'm all, when I was younger, um, I used to have a sketchbook in my car, in my purse, in uh, next to the TV, on the sofa table next to the TV. I would sketch while we were watching a movie on TV. I used to take a sketchbook to the symphony and I would sketch people. And I only got yelled at once or twice by somebody sitting behind me who was so distracted by me having, I'm gonna sit up high. I had it close to me and I would sit and it wouldn't be any bigger than that, you know, a sketchbook about that size, about the size of my hand. And, and I would sketch while the symphony was playing and I would do a dozen of them, you know, before the night was over. And the guy who was behind me complaining about it during intermission actually slept through the second half of the show with snoring that was interrupting the music. So, you know, I felt vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, but I found that, that I loved to, to draw. So I think that's what, you know, why watercolor and, and pastel were so appealing to me. You guys can see some pastels in the background back there. Um, 
go to my Facebook page. I, I've been posting some of the new ones. Um, and um, the ones on the wall are a combination. Those are a combination of water, uh, excuse me, pastels and oils. And, um, and of course, this one uh, there, you can see that one that's in progress that um, oil and um, you know I'm, I'm collecting people wherever I go if it's not a commissioned portrait it's from like some of you sent in paintings that were people you found which is always great fun so um, so anyway does anybody have questions about anything can we direct the conversation in a manner that you need I have always found that trying to paint small is much more difficult than painting a larger painting. You just gotta use little brushes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't mean to be facetious, but, but honestly, you know, all of us are told, use the biggest brush you can. And all of us, I'm sure, have a handful of, you know, 14s and 20s and, uh, and big giant brushes, which are necessary when you're working in big paintings. But um, if you go to the museums and you pay attention to some of the marvelous paintings of painters painting, you'll see that they were working with small things. I will share a quick story with you about meeting Dominique Sennelier. Sennelier is the company that makes pastels. The gentleman uh, that I met is the great grandson of the man who started the company in Paris. And he was a druggist, a pharmacist. And Degas came to him and said, could you make these 10 colors the same way all the time for me? I I'm gonna stop making them if you can make them for me. And, and he had a group of colors and if you look at the Sennelier color chart for pastels, the first 10 colors are Degas colors. And um, when I met Dominique, we were in um, Santa Fe and he was gonna, get, he was gonna give a, a talk to uh, an event we were both part of as instructors. And we went out to dinner that night and he had this marvelous old um, beat up leather briefcase unstructured briefcase like the French use and he opened it up and he said here put your hand out and he he put on my hand some pastels and I don't know if any of you even look at pastel even though if you don't use pastel you know that they're pretty big and chunky some of them are uh, thicker than this you know and about that long uh, some of them are are really big and they said one time one of the manufacturers said well our men who use pastels really want us to make them bigger so that they can handle them easier what Dominique showed me were little tiny cones little conical shapes of pastel that he said this is the way they used to make them and if you go back and historically look at paintings of artists working in plein air they would have marvelous little tiny things in their laps. They would do sketches. They would do, you know, these drawings and uh, the paintings as well. The penchant boxes were tiny. The penchant box might be eight by 10 or smaller. So they weren't taking giant paintings out to paint with giant brushes, unless you're Soroya. You know, and that's, that's part of what I, I was gonna show you. Uh, Donna, Margaret, I'm gonna switch back to share screen for a minute. I okay. wanna show you, this is part of a lesson that, that I use when I teach. And I talk about photography and portrait painting and the fact that the early 19th century photography followed a lot of the rules of the 15th century old masters with their strength of color and design and values and the earliest this is the first known photograph and it was made by a camera of a using sunlight that was touching a pewter treated panel and the chemical on the panel coming through the lens 
uh, forced an image onto the plate. And look how abstract that is and how strong the lights and darks are. It's absolutely fabulous. Um, so, so strong differences between light and dark. The daguerreotype was the next thing. Now understand this picture that I'm showing you was 195 years ago. The daguerreotype came in next in about the 1839 era. And um, this was put together by Louis Daguerre. And he was using um, a, a, a reduced time exposure, but he could only get a single image out of the technique he was using. Then the calotype came in. Look at the, what I want you to look at is light and dark. I want you to look at the strength of the lighting, one direction of light. Uh, look at the strength of the lighting here. Look at this gorgeous line and this gorgeous line. It's a painting, it is. And this Henry Fox Talbot, William Henry Fox Talbot used something called salted paper print and it made in the paper negative, but you can only get one when you did this. And then Collodion in 1951, this new technique came out and it was what they called a wet plate process where they coated and sensitized and exposed um, a, a cellulose nitrate coating on a glass plate. You've seen movies where they showed old photos being taken in the wild west and they would stand in front of a box and they'd slide a glass thing in and pull the glass thing out, but they'd have to develop it right away. And then the next one that came was Edward Weybridge's, um, uh, and his technique allowed you for, for taking instantaneous, he shortened the amount of time he could actually get, let me see, it was something like uh, 25 seconds ex, um, uh, exposure. And that's when this famous photo came about where he was able to get to set up um, trip cords and cameras in different places on a field and let the horse run so he could prove that horses lifted all four feet off the ground at the same time. And then came George Eastman. Well, George Eastman came up with a dry gelatin foam roll of film that was portable. You could make multiples from it. Then we started getting these gifts Look at this, this is Sargent in his studio. Look at the lighting in his studio. This is him working on Madame X. What a gift this is to us. I had to do this. This is available on the internet. Somebody plastered that together for us. How fun is that? To see the real painting next to the, him standing next to it. It has a different frame on it. But look at Carlos Duran. Oh my gosh, this is 1870. We're talking how long ago? And this is at the Detroit Museum. If any of you have been lucky enough to see this, people stand in front of it and they go, it looks like a photograph. Well, what the artists were doing was they were trying to get lighting in their paintings the way the old 15th century artists used to do. And the photographers were trying to do the same thing. They were trying to get photographs to look like these paintings that Bouguereau, this is Bouguereau, who doesn't love Bouguereau? But look at the lighting on this. Oh my God. And if we were gonna paint that, look at the contrast between this dark and this light and how he makes it work and how he makes the clothing work. Here's our guy. This is about 20 years after he did those paintings. So look at him working on those two little girls and the brushes. Little brushes. Wait, let me go back. Look at the brushes. Look at the tips of the brush. Look at the tip of this brush. Teeny tiny little brushes to answer your question, Mike. And then this is Caravaggio. This happened 200 years earlier than the ones I was showing you about Bouguereau. But look at the lighting. Couldn't Bouguereau have painted this? Look at the lighting. And look at the cast shadow from the lighting. And this is what we're not doing with our photographs when we're trying to paint from photographs. They didn't have photographs during Caravaggio. This is, this is Madonna of Loreto. 
and it's in it's in a little chapel in a church near Piazza Navona in Rome. And when I lived in Rome, I used to go and look at this thing. My buddies back in the States where I left, uh, I was in high school in Rome. And my buddies back at home would write me letters about, you know, they were hanging out at McDonald's after school. This is where I was hanging out after school, looking at this kind of thing. So look at the lighting. Look at the lighting. Look at this. Look at this corner, how they've chopped into this corner. And this bright edge doesn't go all the way to here. It stops. It becomes part of this whole space like that. Otherwise, this would have just carried us right out of the picture. Probably was there, but he chose not to show it that way. Soroya. Anybody been to the Soroya Museum in Madrid? Oh my goodness, how this man could paint. And look at the size of his brushes now. Look at that brush, look at those brushes. Well, that's how you paint a painting this size. I've got another picture for you. This is the man himself. I think he's brilliant looking. I would like to have painted his portrait, but he's got a glass cabaret and then he's got a wooden palette down here. And he's using these two and three foot long brushes that sit against the wall. Now, what's important about this picture is this picture was taken in his studio recently. This is the way his wall was maintained. His studio, he could never have taken photographs in his studio because everything bounces red. This is a painting of his wife, Cotil Garcia de Castillo, his wife. And this is the wall of the studio behind this few fabulous mirror. And everything in the, in the studio is gold and red and fabulous colors. And of course, he used to paint outdoors with giant paintings that he would set up. This is a, ten, a seven foot by 10 foot painting that's in the Fondazion Musee Civici de Venezia. It's in St. Mark's Square in Venice. And again, it's one of those paintings that you cannot stop looking at. But look at the lighting in here. What camera is ever going to help you determine those colors, those values, that layering? And this isn't photorealism like we were looking at. You know, people think some of those older painters look like photographs. This doesn't look like a photograph. This is fabulous. So what, what, we're, what we're doing is we're trying to, to make our photographs into painting. And I'm telling you, this is my get on my soapbox speech. These are sketches done from life. And believe me, if you ask for enough time to sit with the people, you can get a draw. This is graphite on white paper. I used to t I used to do a lot of debutantes and and the very first time and I used to use charcoal and chalk on toned paper. And the first time I went into a home with a white carpet and pink silk sofas, I was so stressed I couldn't complete the work sufficiently and I had to go back because I was scared to death I was going to drop charcoal on the white carpet or the pink, pink silk sofas or the white debutante gown. So I started working more and more in graphite and that's what these are. And and this is a close up of one of those sketches. Tell me, you could do a painting from that. You can see structure, you can see design, you can see values. This is a, a, a char, um, pastel sketch. You can see what an MP is. You can tell his personality, you can tell any little boy with golden red hair is going to be not sit still. No, he didn't really sit still, but I got a lot of information from him. When I do the adults, I'll do 20 or more sketches. And I'll always do a head and shoulders oil sketch or watercolor sketch as well. So these were the final contenders for a painting that I was doing uh, as a corporate commission, it was this one that was chosen. These are the head studies. Um, and I should have put the head, the color head studies in here, but I didn't. 
So this was a, a corporate commission that I did for a hospital in Western Tennessee, and and it's life size. And uh, I did most of the work in Raleigh, and then went to them. Um, and made final changes with the final canvas. I went to visit them four times. Um, this is another corporate commission that was two people, but this is a photograph. I would never have tried to copy that photograph. She sat for me and we did this. And this is what I used in my studio as my model when I didn't have her in front of me. Does she have a little more bags under her eyes? Perhaps so. Does she have a pleasant expression? Yes. Something that we could look at much longer than this. That seems so um, forced, even though it wasn't. She's a very happy person and she's a very gentle, kind person. But this was how we sat and talked and when we discussed what we were gonna do for the painting, which one would you have worked from? I have enough information there for the painting to do it. And this is his, and this is the sketch that we finally used, which was great fun with the piano and the curving walnut stairs. But I encourage you guys to, to, to not throw away the photographs. I'm not crazy. I mean, obviously we need as much help as we can get when we're working with people. The whole idea is just to try to find a way to make your um, job easier. And sometimes you can trust your eye more can than you can. Say it again, please. I couldn't hear you. Say it again. I, oh. I think somebody had had not muted their microphone. I don't oh, know. Okay. Is, did somebody have a question? Anybody have questions? No. Okay. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to have been asked to help you guys out and let you see a different version of what uh, what I love to do the most in the world. I I told Margaret and Donna before we started. I said, you know. COVID has let me do what I do, what I do the most, what I love the most. I love to cook. I'm Italian. I love to cook. I love to paint and I love to garden. And I have had such a lovely time um, during this, this slowdown. And um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, when it will be when we all see each other face to face again. I'm looking forward to it. But um, now would be a good time if anybody has questions. I have, no? I have a question. Okay. I, have a, I have a question. Who is it? This is Jill. Okay. Um, when you do the little color studies, the five by sevens, either with a model, sketching a model in place, or like when you were at the Portrait Society thing, how long would you say you spent on one of those? Was it about an hour, uh, or half hour? No, yeah, more, more half hour to 35, 45 minutes, you know. Because they're moving, they're talking, they're doing things. You know, the whole idea is is just to get as much um, of them as possible. In a couple of them, um, I mean, I know all of these people, so that's a bonus. You know, the fact that a lot of times when we are asked to do a painting, we've never met the people before, so we don't have any idea of where we're going with it. But you know, I've known this character for a long time. Dawn has been here to Raleigh numerous times to teach and lecture. And we've worked together on a couple of projects and committees for the Portrait Society. So, I mean, I know their faces. And, and I think a, sometimes a lot of it has to do with memory drawing. If you've ever done that exercise when you were, you know, studying where you, you set up a still life and you put lighting on it and then you um, study and study and study and go away or turn around and you do the do the painting without looking at it and see how accurate your your study was because the more you can memorize what you're going to do um, the better the painting can come out because you're going to really start thinking logically about well say that that big pot 
is rounded in a way that's throwing the light this way and then the light's bouncing off. I got a whole, <laughs> you wonder what I'm looking at. I got a whole table here of props. Okay. So here, Ugh. there's, there's a prop for you. How's that for a prop? Um, that's one of the next paintings. A lot of the still lifes that I did during COVID um, were because I remember certain things that I had stuffed away somewhere and I go, oh, where did I put that copper thing? I need to pull that out or the silver thing or the, you know, whatever. And um, as far as doing people's concerns, you get used to seeing somebody over a period of time and it's, you're going to remember the color of their eyes or the, you know, the fact that their, their shape is oval or square or rounded or whatever. I don't know if that helped you any, Jill, or not. Ask the question again if I didn't answer it correctly. No, 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 you did. And you also <laughs> okay. indicated that you're also very conscious of things when you're looking at people too. <laughs> yes, yes, it's true. I mean, a lot of times uh, I'll be in, well, not anymore, but when I used to be in public places, I would see people and I'd say, hmm, I wonder how I would approach painting that person if I if I were going to paint that person. And my children grew up knowing that their mother was a nut. So there were times when we'd be in some, you know, um, I don't know, after track practice, we'd be in, <laughs> in McDonald's to get a, an ice cream or something. And uh, my son would go, mom, don't, don't, don't look now. But the guy over my shoulder by the window with the backlighting, you know, so my kids grew up being, neither of them pursued art for a living, but both of them are artists because they have the eye. And he'd go, and then, you know, there'd be this fabulous face, you know, of some worker that had come in for a Coke and a hamburger. And I surreptitiously start sketching. So um, just have sketchbook with you all the time. And now that you're locked in, draw from the TV, draw whoever's in the house with you, hang over the fence and draw your neighbor in the <laughs> next yard. You do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hey, um, Luana, this has been fabulous, and we're getting close to nine o'clock. If you got something okay. else you want to say, um, go ahead. Uh, if not, love, you just I done an love. awesome job. Thanks. I'd love, I'd love to answer questions of anybody. Don't be shy. Goodness sakes. Don't be shy, people. Ask questions. Anybody. I have a question. It's hey. Nancy. Hey, Hi. when you were doing the uh, studies at the Portrait Society of America, did you say they were five by seven? Yeah. And did you yeah. say you did them from life? Or did well, you I did them while, photos? I did, them, I did them while they were talking. Yeah. So let me turn did they on. know? Did they know you were painting them? No, it was a Zoom meeting. Oh, Zoom. So they oh. were, okay. That's interesting. Yeah, you know. You know, I mean, that was, to me, that was the fabulous advantage of being a Zoom conference because I could do this, but I couldn't have done that in the, uh, you know, audience at the ballroom at the hotel. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking. Room. That's what I was thinking. Where you <laughs> yeah, me too. So. Oh, no. And I was <laughs> thinking, how did you set up an easel and oil paints there in the middle of the conference? <laughs> so no, that's great. Right. The other nice thing about these is my hands aren't very big, so I can actually hold this yeah. and paint. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas an eight by ten is just a little bit bigger than I could handle. But you can get something like this done in thirty minutes to forty minutes. Right. You know? Whereas if I was doing a big, you know, I'd have to have them sit physically, sit, you know, and stay still. But you know, one, this is, like one, I said, it's about the person. One good thing about the Zoom is you can do yeah. a screen, you can do a screenshot, and so you can have that photograph. Different, you know. I've done that a lot of times. There you I've go. even done that. I've even done that with a TV show. If it's got a beautiful scene on, I'll freeze That's it. Great. And I'll take a picture of it. It's a different world, guys. You got to figure yes, out how to make is. it work for you. 
So, um, yeah, I think I think that's a great idea, Donna. Or, yeah, that was Donna, right? Yeah, Donna. Yeah. Well, you've done a fabulous job. I love the way well, you procreate to show a little video clip of your changes. That was an awesome idea. Well, it's something I've been using for literally years. I, I take my, I used to have a mini iPad. I still do, but I used to take a mini iPad because the mini iPad was, uh, about five by eight, and it would fit into most bags I carried. So I could actually uh, pull that out at a workshop and, you know, t even better. Let me tell you how I did it. I would take a picture of their painting and then open it up and procreate and, and draw on it, paint on it, change it, make two or three different types of changes as options. And then I would email it back to them so that they could have it to remember what we talked about. That was a great so idea. for those of you that are instructors, I mean, I'm still teaching. So, you know, the, those of you that are instructors, that's just another uh, tool to put in your toolkit when you're teaching. It's so easy. It's so nice to have, um, electronics that that benefit you that can help you you know do a better job for your students so you know find find new things yeah I liked, have your, uh, I, I liked your I liked your photography uh, historical lesson too Luana <laughs> because that light in the dark and all of that was really it was really helpful Good, and you good, went the that, extra that, mile with that. That was great. Well, that, that was a very um, abbreviated version of a very long uh, speech about that. But uh, I, I pulled out the, the meat of it that I thought we could use tonight because nearly everybody was sending me photo paintings of photos that had, or paintings that had been done from photos. And uh, I thought it was pertinent. I thought it was very important that you understand how you know, um, like I said, you have some of the most amazing portrait artists in the country in this organization. And I know a lot of them um, are requested and are forced to work from totally from photographs sometimes. But their skill level is so high that they can translate yeah. a two-dimensional photograph to a two-dimensional painting and make it look like you're looking at three dimensions. There, there's a lot of math that has to go on in your head to make that work. And, and it's, it's hard for beginners or intermediate artists to get a 100% successful painting every time from a photograph. And it, it, it's, it's, again, it's about the miles of canvas you've covered. It's just, yeah. you know, we all have war stories. Yes, we do. <laughs> we do. But one of the things, Go ahead. one of the things that uh, helps when you have to work from photographs, because I've had to do that most of my 45 year career, is that you work from life every week with a model, either mm -hmm. in a drawing group or a painting or something like that, so that you have uh, in your mind what things look like from life. Right. So when you look at a photograph, you kind of automatically translate that a little bit exactly exactly because you've done it so much from life mm -hmm. you know what you're looking for I told somebody a story the other day that um, when I first had my studio down I used to have a public studio that was about 800 square feet in a in a building that had been renovated by the city and it had been an old car dealership and the upstairs, the downstairs was tile where the cars were parked. And then the upstairs was about seven or eight layers of um, oak on top of I-beams. And that's where they would drive the cars up to do the mechanics work. Well, I was lucky enough to have one of the uh, studios that had been created upstairs under a skylight. So I worked there for um, 27 years. And uh, in those early years, I would take anything that would come in the door. I mean, I would really try to make it work. If I could, you know, get the job, that's what I was there for. But there was a time, and I remember it so specifically, 
that this person came in with a 1958 Polaroid. If any of you are old enough to know what a Polaroid is, a 1958 Polaroid from their 4th of July picnic, and they wanted me to paint Uncle John, who was the fourth one from the left. Okay. in a picture with about 15 people in it. So his head was probably no bigger than the end of this, than this eraser. And they knew perfectly well what Uncle John looked like. They had lived with him their whole life. But it wasn't a memory jogger for me because I had no idea what he looked like. And his head was only that big. How was I going to do a painting from that? That's when I had to put my foot down. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do that one. But if you bring me real pictures, you know, or bring me Uncle John, I'll be happy to paint them. I'm sure everybody has a story similar to that. That is true. That's <laughs> true. They, they bring you stuff and you're thinking, there's no way. There's no way. Okay. And, and I've done some and thinking, I'll <laughs> never do it again. And yet right. I do it again. And it's different when somebody's deceased. You have to use whatever they can bring you. Precisely. But got to make an exception sometimes. <laughs> hey, look, it's 9 o'clock, and I know uh, you have done a fabulous job. And I just want to tell everybody that Margaret has recorded this, which is awesome now that we can do that. Because all of our meetings now, once they're recorded, they're put on YouTube for the Portrait Society of Atlanta. So if you anybody missed this, they certainly can watch it again or come back and good. watch good well i hope we embedded a few lessons in it that somebody can use not it's not the same lesson for everybody but maybe everybody got a little something somewhere in it i, I learned a lot i think so good it's been good. great thank, thank you Luana. thank you thank you for letting me do this i'm so happy oh thank you for doing it i hope i get to see That's all great. the little faces someday soon <laughs>